Last week, we learned how a catastrophic event like a global flood would explain the Grand Canyon and other geological features we see around the world. And this week, we'll begin to look at some of the fossil evidence that confirms a global flood too. To begin, we need to define what we mean by fossil, and then we can discuss how fossils are formed. And for our discussion today, we'll be speaking of petrified fossils, which are fossils that have actually been turned into stone. So, a petrified fossil is evidence of a plant or an animal preserved in rock by casting, mineralization, or mineral replacement. A fossil cast, in this case of a track, is made when the shape or activity of an organism is preserved in rock, but the organism itself is not preserved. This picture is of a dinosaur footprint that was permanently cemented into stone for us to study today. But dinosaurs are not the only creatures out there that make fossil footprint castings. When someone leaves a footprint in concrete, for example, it's essentially the same exact thing. Obviously, the dinosaur track was not made in solid rock, it was made in wet, sedimentary deposits, we might normally call mud. Then later, those sediments hardened into rock, just like concrete does. These dinosaur footprints are found all over the world, and there are even many different places to see them here in Texas. One such place, along the Paluxy River near Glenrose, has even reported footprints of humans and dinosaurs in the same casting. And these tracks have been verified by CT scans. But as you can see, forming a fossil cast of a dinosaur track required three main ingredients. And they were a dinosaur to make the track, the sediments to make the casting, and some water to make the sediments hold their shape. If this was a dinosaur walking on dry land, the imprint would have never had the clear definition or preservation we see here. The next way a fossil can be formed is by petrification or permineralization. In these cases, after an organism is rapidly buried in sediment, groundwater carries dissolved minerals into the microscopic pores in bones, shells, wood, and more and that water deposits the mineral content. The original porous structure of the organism is then preserved by the deposited minerals and converted into stone. If an organism is not rapidly buried in sediments, normal decay prevents the item from being preserved. Scavengers quickly dismember it, or it will heavily deteriorate in a fairly short period of time. But even if an organism is buried in sediments that contain the correct minerals like silica, the minerals themselves will not fossilize any structures unless they are carried by water into the porous spaces in the bone. So the minerals must be dissolved in water to actually fossilize an item also. That means that we must have four ingredients for fossilization by petrification in regards to organic matter, and they are an organism to be fossilized, a rapid burial for preservation, sediments that contain the correct minerals, and water to carry those minerals into the porous structures of the organism. Without those ingredients, a typical permineralized organic fossil, as we find all over the world, would not be created. Now, we can reduce that list to three items when we discuss the fossilization of non-organic items that do not rapidly decompose because they do not need to be buried for preservation. Teddy bears, ice skates, hats and more can be rapidly fossilized by hanging them in a flow of water that's carrying large quantities of dissolved minerals. So all you need here is an item, some water, and the right dissolved minerals. For example, it only took two weeks to fossilize this teddy bear in a mineral spring found in Czechoslovakia. 
So fossilization is not a long, time-consuming process, contrary to popular opinion. All that's required is water, minerals, and a porous structure. And in the case of things that quickly rot, a quick burial to prevent scavenging and hold things together. The last method of fossilization we need to discuss here is based on a process called replacement. In this method, chemicals in the water dissolve an organism and replace its structure with minerals that were being carried in the water. So the shell or bones of the organism are no longer present, but a copy has been made in the minerals that basically matches the original structure as seen here. This type of fossil, as the ones we've seen before, clearly requires water and dissolved minerals to form. So we're beginning to see a trend here. The typical fossil is formed by wet sediments, just like you'd find in a worldwide flood. And most organic fossils require rapid burial in those wet sediments to be fossilized in the astounding condition we often find them in. And confirming rapid preservation, this fossil, for example, is in amazing condition, and there is no evidence of decay or decomposition at all before it was fossilized. We can even see the scales on this particular fossil fish, and there are no signs of scavenging, as we might expect to see, if the fish had died and was laying out in the open and then was later buried. So, we should ask, how does a fish get quickly covered by dirt and sediments to be fossilized so pristinely? Fish don't typically swim in a place that's subject to rapid burial and sediments. But what if the flood moves sediments from the continents into the oceans very rapidly? Along that same line of thinking, we find fossil jellyfish too, but they are so delicate that they dissolve away quickly if exposed to the sun in just a couple of days. So they must have been quickly buried for preservation, then fossilized afterward fairly rapidly. That is the only method that makes sense of all the evidence. There are signs of rapid fossilization, sudden burial, an amazing preservation in the fossil record. And we know that water must have been present in every place that a petrified fossil was formed. And one more important thing to note is this. At least 95% of all animal fossils are of marine invertebrates. That not only confirms how water must have been present to form a fossilized organism, it also speaks about the oceans covering the continents because these marine fossils are found pretty much everywhere. Now that we have a clear idea of how fossils are formed, let's hear about some more fossil evidence that supports a worldwide flood. And today we have a great scientist with us to help us uh, validate the truth of creation. His name is Dr. Andrew Snelling. Good morning, Dr. Snelling, how good to have you with us today. Uh, Dr. Here. Snelling is a PhD in uh, geology from the University of Sydney, I believe. That's correct. An Australian uh, by nationality, uh, but a creation scientist by choice. And today we're going to be talking about the evidence for the worldwide flood. Well, help us do that today. Well. Many geologists are now accepting catastrophism. I mean, if, if the flood really occurred, then we'd expect to find evidence of catastrophism in the rock record. By catastrophism, of course, we mean that there were short, sudden events, and they were violent and worldwide in nature. Even the geologists now recognize the, the concept of the dinosaurs being wiped out on a global scale. There were mass extinctions. Creatures died out on a global scale. That was catastrophic. Traditionally, geologists have bought into the idea of uniformitarianism or slow and gradual process. It's actually a philosophy of science that's based on the assumptions that the processes operating in the past have been the same as what we see operating, observed operating in the present. Um, and so normally people uh, understand this in terms of the present is the key to the past. In other words, slow and gradual present day processes of rivers slowly can't, uh, carrying sand and mud has always been the way it was. And so, you know, rock layers of mudstone, sandstone, 
have formed as a result of rivers slowly and gradually uh, carving out the, the land surface. But that, those views are now being challenged by the evidence we see for catastrophism in the rock record. I think that's so fascinating. Uh, j just the idea of uniformitarianism doesn't face the reality of life. I would say to our viewers, you think about your life. Your life isn't shaped by what happens on the average days, but there were big days in your life. The day you found out you were sick, the day you lost a child, the day you lost your job. As you look back at life, it were those big events, those catastrophes that really shaped what's happened and who you are. Yeah. And we live in that kind of a world. And the world has been shaped by some big events, not just the everyday humdrum. And yeah, I think and that's the, so important. And the difference between uniformitarianism and catastrophism is that uh, the belief the present is the key to the past requires extensive timelines, whereas catastrophism, it's very easy to telescope it into just one major catastrophic event at the time of the flood. And so it comes down to old earth and young earth again? Yes, in a sense it does. Okay. So let's start by going to the Grand Canyon. The reason we go to the Grand Canyon, it's an area that is well exposed and well studied. And it's in all the textbooks, so everybody understands that area. Now, if we look at all these rock layers through the walls of the Grand Canyon, you can see them here. I've got them arrowed. Every one of those rock layers that are arrowed right to the top of the Grand Canyon up there have marine fossils in them. Now, Everyone. the top of the Grand Canyon is over a mile above sea level. And therefore, how did marine fossils, that creatures that live in the ocean, get up here on top of the continent at that elevation. It means the ocean waters must have flowed over the continents. And uh, one of those rock units we want to look in detail is halfway down, the red wall limestone. Now the reason why it's got the name red wall you'll see in a moment, but you can see it is here halfway down the canyon. And it's a limestone. It's easy to understand lime that's turned to stone. We can see in this next picture the cliffs, and uh, I've, I've pointed out where the red wall limestone is. You can see it there, see? Uh -huh. It forms a red wall. It's a limestone that forms a red wall. See, Make not all of geology is difficult. And uh, we can see the same when we get down to the Colorado River level. Again, I've arrowed the cliff there. See, That's a red, red wall. Okay. And what's exciting about this red wall limestone, it's full of fossils, marine fossils up on the continent, ocean waters flowing up onto the continent. You can see in this photograph that we've got uh, a crinoid, which is a sealer. You can see it here. It's the stem of a, a it looked like a, a plant, but it actually is a creature that had tentacles, that, you know, fern-like tentacles. And over here we see a bryozoan. See the, the lace features here? Okay. A bryozoan was a lace coral. And you can see these are broken remains in this, in this limestone. And are those, uh, do those still exist today? Absolutely. In the ocean, you can yes, still see those still same... Yes, still see these creatures today. Yes. Here we see a brachiopod, which okay. is a lamp shell. It's, it's a variation on a clamp. Right. And in this limestone, particularly one of the major ones that we found in the, in the canyon, is this nautiloid fossil. It's a straight-shelled nautiloid. You can see it here. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. It had a head like a squid out here. Uh -huh. And it, you can see this tubes runs down the centre. What it used to do is it would suck in water and shoot the water out the, like that and so it could propel itself. It was like a, a miniature jet engine. <laughs> now we find in the, in the Grand Canyon nautiloid fossils that are six feet long and one foot long and some in between, you know, three and four feet long. What does that tell us? The little ones were baby ones, the big ones, bigger ones were parents and then these were the grandparents. Okay. And so we find lots of these straight-shelled nautiloids. Most people are familiar with a coiled nautilus today. Well, these ones were straight. And uh, that means that when we find big ones, little ones, intermediate ones buried together, we're actually looking at what was a living population that got rapidly buried. And uh, the exciting thing is that we find these. In, see this bed here? This bed is about seven foot thick seven foot thick, and we can trace it right through the Grand Canyon. In fact, we can trace it from uh, the eastern Grand Canyon. This is one of the prime locations there, Nautiloid Canyon, but we could also find it in the suburbs of Las Vegas. Wow. So we're looking at a distance of something like 180 miles, and you can see this bed just outside the housing estates there in Las Vegas. 
And uh, the National Park didn't know this bed was there until we discovered it and we went through it. You can see all these locations where we, we find them. So here in the middle of a limestone, which the geologists say accumulated slowly and gradually, we've got evident of, uh, evidence of catastrophism on a, on a grand scale right through the canyon. In a matter of hours, you have all these fossils buried marine fossils up on the continents, which is exactly the sort of evidence you'd expect to find for Noah's flood. Absolutely. The ocean waters came up onto the continent, bringing these marine creatures and nailed them and buried them catastrophically. Well, that's not the only example we find. In France, we find hundreds of thousands of marine creatures buried with amphibians, spiders, scorpions, millipedes, insects and reptiles. You know, notice something interesting there? that they're all land creatures, okay? So you've got a mixture of land and marine creatures together. Yeah. You know, if a flood coming, the ocean water's coming up into the continents, it brings the marine creatures and buries them with the land creatures. Doesn't seem to me there could be any other explanation how you could Absolutely have land creatures not. and marine creatures a together. Local, a local flood would be on the land and you don't even have land creatures. The land creatures a global flood, the That's ocean right. waters come up onto the continents, bringing marine creatures and bury them with land That's creatures. Right. Yeah. And we see that in many places. In fact, if we go uh, to uh, Colorado, here we are, Colorado, the Florence and Beds, again we see insects, freshwater cl uh, clamshells, fish, birds. I mean, how do you fossilise a bird slowly? <laughs> you know, know. <laughs> it's got to drop from the sky and get buried straight away. And right. hundreds of plant species, including blossoms, all buried together. Let me show you some photographs of some of these uh, fossils. For example, here we see in this next photograph, look at that beautifully preserved fish. I'm going to show you some more in a moment. And then we can see a bee. I mean, look at the wing the venation, the pattern yeah. in the wings. See, you can see the... Something had How to do you happen preserve? quickly. I mean, you yes. step on a bee and squish it and right. it's, it just rots very quickly. So look at the state of preservation of this bee. It had to have been buried very rapidly. And here we can see in this next uh, photograph, we can see the blossom. See the, the blossom here? Wow. And you can see the leaves beautifully and exquisitely preserved, which is what we see in these fossil graveyards. Again, a mixture in that bed of watery and land creatures. We can see uh, here again in uh, Wyoming. Wyoming, again, alligator, fish of many varieties. We've got birds, turtles, mammals, including bats, <laughs> all buried together with mollusks, which are clams, right. crustaceans, and insects, and palm leaves. Again, a mixture of land and sea dwelling creatures. Evidence that the ocean waters flooded onto the continents and buried all these things together. Now I want to give you another example. I've got to talk about Australia. I mean, you've got I, to. I've got to let you see. Now we're going to Tasmania at the island state of Australia, which is down the south, right down the bottom, and it's a very pleasant place. Let's look at Fossil Bluff. You can see it's an 80 foot high cliff, 80 foot high and it's limestone. And we find in this the fossils. First of all, we see these clams. See these broken shells? The broken shells indicate that it was rapid and catastrophic. Look at the little pebbles we find, mm -hmm. okay? To move the pebbles, you need fast-moving water. So this was a fast-moving ocean current that uh, collected all these shells, smashed them up and broke them up and bury them together. See another one over here, yeah. near the, see the, the camera lens cap for scale. So these are quite large. And in this fossil bed, we found the remains of a toothed whale. See the teeth? Look at that. Okay, the teeth. And this is uh, on display at the museum in the, in the capital of the state, in Hobart. So that was the toothed whale, and in that same cliff, we found the remains of a marsupial possum. Here we are, you can see the the backbone, the, uh, the vertebrae, and here's some of the limb bones here and here. So to state the obvious, you have the marine animal and the, and the land animal all exactly. in the same See, fossil bed. See, that's the bed. question I ask yes. people. Right. When was the last time you saw a whale and a possum living together? Yeah, can't happen. No, you don't see it happen. They could die together, and but so they couldn't live together. You have together. to ask yourself the question, how did a whale and a possum 
get buried together. How I indeed. Mean, it means that the ocean waters had to flood up onto the continent and of course they had to have been buried together. You know, many people see in textbooks drawings of past environments. This is where creatures live together. But the only thing we can be absolutely certain of is this is where they are buried together because that's where we observe them today. Now, I'm dying to ask you how uh, an uh, old earth evolutionist is going to refute what you've said, but we have to take a break first. Okay. So you just hold on to your answer. I can see your gun's loaded and you're ready to uh -huh. shoot, but we got to take a break. Don't you go away. Dr. Snelling's going to talk to us about how this overwhelming evidence is refuted by the other side. So you stay with us. We'll be right back. We are back with Dr. Andrew Snelling and we are talking about the evidence of a worldwide flood and how that validates the truth of scripture. Now, Dr. Snelling, so far we've made two big points in this show. Would you review them for us? Yeah, the first point was that if the flood really occurred, we'd expect to find evidence that the ocean waters flooded the continents. And uh, the evidence we find is marine creatures way up on the continents, up on, for example, we talked about the Grand Canyon, at the top of the Grand Canyon, marine fossils, many layers of marine fossils. And we'd expect to find, because it was a catastrophe, that the plants and creatures were buried catastrophically. And we saw land and sea dwelling creatures buried together. I think that's amazing. In fact, the evidence seems so re unrefutable to me, irrefutable to me, that it makes me wonder that when this same evidence is looked at by an old earth evolutionist, uh, what do they do with this well, evidence? Well, they accept that individual layers could have formed catastrophically, but they want the millions of years in between. So what they propose is that the land surface sank, so the ocean came in and brought the fossils, and then it rose again, uh, to, to account for the millions of years in between where there was no, no deposition, no ocean on the, on the continents. The trouble is, imagine the Grand Can Canyon area where you've about got eight different layers with marine fossils. The continent's got to sink, the ocean's got to come in, then it's got to rise, then it's got to sink, then it's got to rise, sink, yeah. rise, the, sink, the rise. The earth isn't sitting times. on an elevator piston. And, no, it isn't no, going no, up and down. You can't explain that. Right. It's hard enough getting it to happen once, let alone so many times. And so, it, we, it's so much simpler. There's a, a principle in geology in uh, science called Occam's razor. Right. The simplest explanation is usually the right one. So you had one lot of water, ocean water coming across, right. depositing all those layers one on top of the other very rapidly, and then retreating at the end of the flood. So let me go up to the screen and show you what I have for you. We also find as another example, which, which is relevant to hear us here in the Pittsburgh area, is seven trillion tons of vegetation in the world's coal beds. You know, the black stuff we dig up and burn in a power station. Well, most people don't realize that that's buried vegetation. It's fossilized vegetation. And at all the world's coal beds, there's at least seven trillion tons. It's a lot. And the coal beds here in the eastern United States are also found in England and right across over to Russia. And it's the same coal beds. Yeah. But more of that uh, later. Okay. Let's have a look at. Uh, one of these ammonite fossils. This is an, one of these coiled ammonite fossils. Yes. And uh, this is in the chalk in England. Now look at the size. There's a pen for scale. Right. That's about six inches across. So we're talking about eight inches, inches, 18 inches across yeah. this, this creature. Now the chalk in which this is buried, the geologists say, accumulated slowly and gradually. But you imagine uh, how long it would take to bury that if at an inch per thousand years. I mean, this creature didn't sit around for thousands of years waiting to be fossilized. It happened catastrophically. And this is what the chalk looks like under the microscope. See the tiny little, little uh, evidence of uh, little tiny shells? Here's a bigger one. You can see the different chambers. But there are thousands of different There's units There's trillions there. of these. Trillions. I mean, this is under a microscope. This is right. about 50 times magnification. And uh, so you can imagine these tiny critters buried on a mass scale, burying those bigger ammonites. This is a, a global scale fossil graveyard in England, in, in America, in Australia, all around the world. All over the world. Isn't that the evidence we'd expect to find for a catastrophic global flood as the Bible records? Absolutely yes. Now, rapid burial of plants and creatures. Look at this fossil fish. Now ask yourself the question whether all the fish dead fish on the bottom of the ocean waiting to be fossilized today. If the present is the key to the past, we ought to be able to see fish 
being fossilised today. We're not making any fossils no, today. No, in fact, when a fish dies, it either floats or it's, it rots or it's eaten by scavengers. Look at the, the eye socket here. Look at the, the ribs. The details the incredible. The details you can Look see. Look at the tail, the, how I mean, fine I like it to is, say yes. to people, to produce a fossil fish like this, what you do is, when your pet goldfish isn't looking, back up a concrete wagon <laughs> and dump the concrete on top of it, because that's the only way you'll preserve a, a fossil fish like that. Something has to happen quickly. That's right. Now let me give you another example. This is what we call a trilobite. It's got a head, okay, it's got a body section through here, and then it's got a tail. So it's got three lobes, so we call it a trilobite. It's like a, a little um, snail-like creature mm -hmm. on the that, that lived on the bottom of the ocean. But look at the state of preservation, and particularly, see this knob here? Yeah. That's the eye, the eye of the, of the trilobites. They're in perfect form. It's that, and we can see preserve the lens of the eye of the trilobite. And it's so complicated that we, with all our ingenuity, have only been able to build similar lenses in the last five decades. Huh. And look at the exquisite preservation of these creatures. Catastrophic burial by a global flood. Uh, I like this. This is an Australian one. That's example. why you like it. You're a good and bloke. Mawsonides sprigii, named after two famous Australia, uh, Australian geologists. Now, most people think that's a fossil flower, but it's actually a fossil jellyfish. Oh. Now, the man who found these in outback South Australia over an area of 400 square miles found hundreds and hundreds of these jellyfish fossils. Now, you think about it. What happens to a jellyfish when it gets washed up on the sand? Because this is found in a sandstone, OK? It would melt in the sun, yeah. or the waves and the wind would break it up. Right. So the man who found these jellyfish fossils over 400 square miles in outback South Australia, hundreds of these jellyfish fossils, said they all had to form in less than one day. Wow. So you see, that's rapid catastrophic burial, where the ocean waters are, are wiping out all these jellyfish and burying them rapidly. How long did it take to form these two fish fossils? I mean, here, one fish didn't get time to finish his breakfast before the two buried. of them were buried in fossilized. So one second that fish is alive, and the next second it's being exactly. buried. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Okay. And so this is what we mean by rapid burial. And look at the exquisite state of fossil preservation. Again, you can see the backbone, you can see the fin, you can see the tails. And there's lots of examples of, of this in the fossil record. Let's have a look at this next one. This is one of my favourite examples. Here, this is actually comes from a textbook on evolution, <laughs> and so you'd think it would be evidence of slow and gradual processes. This is an ichthyosaur. You can see the snout here. An ichthyosaur was a marine reptile. It's not a fish, it's actually a reptile. Here's the tail down here. And this, this guy, it's actually a, a mother. She's six foot long, okay? Wow. And notice something interesting here. What's this we see here? That's a little baby. Oh. And this is buried in a limestone. And uh, this is a mother, six feet long, buried, having just given birth to a little baby. Literally in the process of birth. Exactly. It's now buried. you think about it. A creature of this size, we know from earthquakes and tsunamis, that a lot of creatures sense danger and escape from the danger zone. So. If this mother had sensed the danger was coming and there was time for her to escape, she would have escaped. You know, when this photograph was published in the journal Nature, the editor put under a caption, time freeze frame. What he meant was that one minute, mother was giving birth to a, a baby, a split second later, tons and tons of sand, of sand and mud just buried her alive. And she didn't have time to escape, and a little baby was just there. So this is incredible evidence for rapid burial and exquisite fossil preservation, which is the kind of evidence you'd expect in a catastrophic global flood. And not only are ocean and land-dwelling creatures buried in the same places all over the earth, we also find marine fossils from the oceans on the tops of mountains like in the Andes. Here, the New York Times was reporting on whale fossils found at an altitude of more than 5,000 feet above sea level in South America. 
and they recognized that the mountains rose very rapidly from the sea at some point in the past. And even the peak of Mount Everest is composed of a marine limestone that shows clearly at some point in the past the highest mountain peak on Earth was once underwater. Just as the New York Times mentioned about the whale fossils in the Andes, it's clear that even Mount Everest was once underwater sometime before the peak rose out from the sea. And as a matter of fact, the peak of Mount Everest is still rising at an estimated rate of 0.5 to 2.5 inches per year. And all of this scientific evidence of the flood fits very well with Psalm 104 that says, God established the earth on its foundations. It will never be upended. The watery deep covered it like a garment. The waters reached above the mountains. Your shout made the waters retreat. At the sound of your thunderous voice, they hurried off as the mountains rose up and the valleys went down to the place you appointed for them you set up a boundary for them that they should not cross so that they would not cover the earth again. Truly the evidence for the global flood is astounding and we'll take one more look at the case for a global flood next time as we learn about how many of the dinosaurs died by what looks like drowning while many cultures around the world have recorded the key details of the global flood.